It's dry and desert land I tell myself keep walking on Here's something up ahead Water falling like a song An everlasting stream You really carry
this place for what love has done Jesus Christ be glorified through the songs that we're singing and I love that phrase shout for joy David does that in Psalm 27 in Psalm 27 it says that David went into the temple to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord to seek the Lord and then it says he literally offered up sacrifices of shouts of joy and then it said he sang and he, he made uh, he made music and he praised the Lord and so I, but the one thing that, that stuck out to me when I was reading through that is that, yeah, we sing a song, you know, we shout for joy. And we come in here and we sing these songs first and, you know, before the message is uh, ever preached. And, and there's, that's biblical. Uh, 2 Kings 3.15, before the word was ever preached, music was sang first. And before the word was ever preached, uh, he said, hey, bring the musicians in here to basically prepare the atmosphere for the word to be delivered if you've ever wondered why we do music first that's totally irrelevant from what I'm going to right now but that was just a side note ADD kicked in um, so anyway but what I was talking about in this is David enters into the temple and just to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord to seek the Lord and so I, I pray that that all of us as we continue to this next song would would be in that mindset that we gather in here and and uh, yeah we've already We've already sung a couple of songs, but before we do this next one that we just think of, we want to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord. We just want to seek the Lord and, and seek what he would speak into us, whether it be through the music, through the message, uh, through someone that you're sitting beside right now, through the person that greeted you when you came in through the front door. Maybe it's through the person who told you where to park, whatever it is, but you're truly with a, a heart set and a mindset of, God, I'm, I'm, I'm coming here to seek after you, to seek after you, to gaze upon your beauty. So just have that in your heart and mind as we sing this next song. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that makes this heart adore you.
One of the things that we've said is that when men get better, everything gets better. When men get stronger, families get stronger, churches get better, communities get stronger, the culture rises, the morality of a culture rises. Everything benefits when men get better. Over the last three weeks, we have talked about the fact that uh, men are created for a mission. If you were here in week number one, really the foundational truth of all of this teaching has been built upon the story of creation in Genesis chapter 2 where we discovered that every man is made for a mission. That is that men are wired for conquest. Men are made to subdue. Men are created with this aggressive spirit on the inside where men are called to conquer. And this is the reason that every man cares about winning. And that desire to win then extends into every part of life. We learned two weeks ago that every man cares about his marriage. While he may have failed marriages in the past, or he may have regrets from the past, or he may even be the victim of some things in a marriage in the past, here's the thing. Every man who is in a marriage wants to be, while he may struggle, at his core, he wants to be the man in that family, in that marriage that God has called him to be. He wants to lead. He wants to be respected and admired and loved. He wants to love his wife like Christ loved the church, though he may have no idea how to do it. There's something within him where he wants to be the husband that God has called him to be. Last weekend, we talked about the fact that every man cares about his kids. And even though he may feel overwhelmed with his paternal responsibilities, and he may have a lot of regrets, he wants to be. And when he looks at those kids, whether they're five or 55, he wants, he longs that he would be able to influence their lives and inspire them and be the dad that they need for him to be. Every man feels that way. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about a man's legacy. Every man cares about the mark that he leaves on this world. We're going to talk about uh, health and well-being. Every man cares and needs to discover what God says to us about our bodies. But those are the things we have talked about, and those are the things that we're going to talk about. Now, at the beginning of this teaching series, we said to you that this was going to be a real-life, honest look at the genuine needs and concerns of every man. And no series, no teaching series that purports to deal with the real-life concerns and needs of every man would be an honest teaching series if we did not deal with the subject which is at hand today. I want to tell you that before I planned this teaching series, just when I was praying about it and, and sort of crafting in my heart and mind or seeking to respond to the Holy Spirit as he was crafting in my heart and mind what we would talk about, I did a survey of about 20 different men. I didn't give them any context. I didn't say, this is why I'm asking you this. I just asked this question. I said to 20 men, tell me the things that you think every man cares about. What are the things that are really important in a man's life? As you can imagine, the answers that I got were varied. I mean, a lot of different answers that came in. But I asked 20 men, and all 20 included in their list of the things that men care about, the topic of sex. Every single one of those 20, the common denominator in every single response that I got was the issue of sex. And so I knew in the beginning that if I was going to deal with the needs and the concerns of men, that this would be a topic that we would need to talk about. Now, I also need to tell you that I have surveyed some of my fellow pastors, and I have asked them. I don't just mean the guys on our staff, but guys who are, who are lead pastors in churches. And I've said to them, have you ever spent an entire message preaching on sex? None of them have. And we have agreed together that I'm crazy. <laughs> but welcome to church this Sunday morning. Yes. Now, we'll tell you that while this subject of sexuality is far too often taboo in the church, that is to say that churches simply do not speak of it, it is not unmentionable in the Bible. It is, in fact, very, very prominent in the Bible. Did you know that if you were to read through your New Testament and you were to look at every book of the New Testament, almost 
Every book of the New Testament has warnings, speaks very clearly into this view of sexuality, sexual immorality, and how we are to live our lives as followers of Christ. I want to show you just a few of those. Again, we could go through almost every book of the New Testament. Let me show you four of them. We'll begin in Matthew chapter 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount, as many of you know. And Jesus said, but I tell you, that if, a, any, that if anyone looks on a woman to lust after her or lustfully, he has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So in the very beginning of the kingdom of God on the earth, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said we're going to deal with this issue of lust and immorality that is, that is uh, in the hearts of people. If anyone looks on a woman lustfully, he has committed adultery already. Acts chapter 15, in the very infancy of the church, in the beginning of the church, Scripture gives a command to people in the church. And it says in verse 29, you are to abstain from sexual immorality. It is a command that we are to avoid sexual immorality. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 13, for the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. So often these bodies which are uh, used sinfully in a way that dishonors the Lord, in fact, we are betraying the very purpose of our creation in doing so. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 3. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. And what does that mean in so many cases? That you should avoid sexual immorality. And that each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and that is honorable. So there are four examples. And again, I could give you, of 26 New Testament books, I could give you about 24 examples where these different letters of the New Testament and scriptures from the New Testament speak to us about this issue of purity or avoiding sexual immorality. Now, let me rein your thinking in for just a minute because what you probably do when it comes to this subject, is because I do it too, and I think this is where we're most comfortable. When this subject comes up, most of us automatically begin to think, well, really, I'm, I don't have a problem. The problem are the extremes. And all of us are aware of the horrible extremes of sexual depravity. We know what happens when people sin sexually and how that that creates on the margins, still far too frequent, but on the margins of the culture, it creates horrible, abusive, hurtful, even murderous sorts of realities. Things like rape and murder and abuse and molestation and things like that. And, and very often we come to this subject and we say, well, that's not me. I mean, I don't even, I, I would never even consider such a thing. So I don't really have problem with this issue. And yet I want to rein our thinking in and make it a, a bit more applicable to all of us than that, because that's not really what we're talking about. In fact, I, I was reading a book in preparing for this, this book that I've had on my shelf for a number of years. I would highly recommend it to every man in the room. In fact, I would recommend it to wives to read to understand your husbands better. And there's a student version of it that I would recommend parents get for their for their boys, their teen boys, but it's called Every Man's Battle. Many of you have read it, perhaps. This book has really become a classic over the last couple of decades um, in, in regard to this particular subject, Every Man's Battle. In the book, Every Man's Battle, Stephen Arterburn, who is the author of that book, says, we have countless examples or countless churches that are filled with countless men who are encumbered by sexual sin. He then says, these men are weakened by low-grade sexual fevers. I want you to think about that terminology for just a minute, because what it does is it says, look, the problem is not the super fever that's out there. We're not really talking about those, those extreme categories, the cancers, if you will, of sexual immorality. But really what we're talking about is the more mundane-seeming, the more normal occurrences where you have people whose lives, particularly men, whose lives are just being dragged down, chained down. They're weakened by this low-grade sexual fever. Now, I want to share some statistics with you that sort of reveal that this is true. 
And I need to admit before I share the statistics that I recognize that sometimes statistics are not, you know, completely reliable. I mean, they're based on surveys and answers to questions that are asked. And one of the things that pollsters have learned over the years is that when people are surveyed, they don't always tell the truth in their answers. And particularly when they're being asked about sexual issues, they're, they're less likely to tell the truth. But I would submit to you that if that's the case, these statistics may be incorrect, but they're probably incorrect on the low end. They're probably worse than these numbers would really reveal. This is, this is honestly um, speaks very, very poignantly into what uh, Stephen Arterburn says about this low-grade sexual fever. Think about this. The surveys reveal that 50% of men who attend evangelical churches view pornography on a regular basis. 50%. They reveal that 30% of men in church, 30% of men who attend evangelical churches will have an extramarital affair at some point in their lifetime. And that 65% of unmarried Christian men have been sexually active in the last year. 65%. Now, think of those numbers in the context or with the backdrop of what we learned in week number one of this teaching, that men are made to conquer. And that the problem is not how that men have been made, it is that we are the fallen sons of Adam. So what men do in conquering is that we conquer not for the good of others when we're acting sinfully, but we conquer not for the good of others, but for our own satisfaction and benefit. Now, when you consider that in light of this idea of, of sexual immorality, then it's absolutely true that I will have what I want. I will do what I want in terms of what I view online. I'm, I'm my own master. I will do what I want in terms of what I do online. I will, uh, I will have an extramarital affair, some man might say, because it's what I want. And yet it brings harm and pain to someone else. 65% of unmarried Christian men say that they are sexually active in the last 12 months. Ladies, let me just speak to you ladies for just a minute. If you're a, if you're a young single lady, an older teen girl that's in this room, uh, if, if you're an unmarried uh, woman of any age, let me be clear. If there is a man in your life, even if he's sitting next to you right now, I say this without fear of, uh, of any sort of pushback. It's absolutely true. If there is a man in your life and he is not your husband and he is pressuring you, pushing you, leading you to be sexually active, he is not being God's man in your life. He is rather, he's not seeking your holiness. It's not about intimacy. It is at the end of the day about his own pleasure and conquest so that he can be satisfied. And you need to understand that and you need to deal with that as a reality, okay? Understand that this is what men who are fallen sons of Adam, we do too frequently. We sin, we conquer for our own pleasure our own benefit, our own satisfaction. Now, we have to deal with this, guys. We have to be honest about this. We, we, we can't any longer pretend that this is not an issue in the church. And guys, let me challenge you. We have to quit joking about this. We have to quit letting these be little backroom sort of snicker moments where it's just boys will be boys, and we just pretend that it's not a big deal. If nearly every book in the New Testament speaks to sexual purity, it is a big deal in the eyes of God. And it is time for men to deal with it as it is. And ladies, let me challenge you. It's time for ladies to stop rolling their eyes and being disgusted by every man they see. And seeing every man as a pervert and an animal. And we need to understand the way that God has wired us. We'll talk about that in a minute. And our sons, listen, upstairs in that youth room and across the parking lot in that in that NAC theater and our schools and our high schools and our middle schools and our grammar schools, our boys are growing up, and they need to know how to handle the way that God has made them. and They need to know how to control themselves in a way that honors the Lord, as the Bible says in Thessalonians. Absolutely, we need to talk about this battle for sexual purity. And loved ones, if it is anything, it is a battle for sexual purity. And when you read the book of Proverbs, many of you know this, that the book of Proverbs is a book 
where there is wisdom being dispensed from the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon, to his sons. And so this is where I want us to begin today. Take your Bibles, please, and open to that book, if you will, Proverbs, and we're going to go to chapter number 5. And as we begin learning about this, I want to say to you that there is hope. If some of you feel frustrated, if the, if, the, um, if the statistics have made you a little uncomfortable so far, if you feel a little fidgety in your seat right now, I, I get it. If you think you're fidgety hearing it, I'm fidgety saying it, okay? So let's just own it, all right? But guys, I want you to know there's hope, Okay? I want you to know, listen, I know it's a battle, but Christ is more than just your Savior. He's your champion. And the Word of God is your sword, and the Holy Spirit is your warrior. And there is victory to be had in this battle for sexual purity. Solomon, in Proverbs chapters 5, 6, and 7, is speaking into the life of his sons, and he's speaking to them about this very issue of purity. This, this book, and particularly this section, is full of warning and instructions about sexual purity. So we're going to read beginning in chapter 5. You follow along uh, as I read. Verse number 1, my son, attend unto my wisdom and bow your ear to my understanding that you may regard discretion and that your lips may keep knowledge. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb and her mouth is smoother than oil, but her end is as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, her steps take hold of hell. Lest you should ponder the path of life, her ways are unknowable, immovable, they are unstable. You cannot know them. Hear me now, therefore, O ye children, and depart not from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her, and do not come near to the door of her house. That is the door of that strange woman that he's talking about. If you do, verse 9, just know this, that you will give your honor unto others and your years unto the cruel. Strangers will be filled with your wealth and your labors shall be in the house of a stranger. You will mourn at the last, at the end of your life, when your flesh and your body are consumed and you will say, oh, how I have hated instruction. And the heart, my heart has despised reproof. I've not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear unto them that instructed me. And as a result, I was almost in all evil. I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the congregation and the assembly. Let me speak just momentarily out of that verse. We're sitting in church today. This is not an issue simply for the unchurched. It cannot be said today, hey, preacher, you're preaching to the choir. No, I'm not. This passage says that it's possible to be in the assembly, to sit in the church week after week, and yet be on the very edge of ruin as a result of this, uh, this, this uh, problem of sexual immorality. And in fact, we don't have to look far to know that that's true, do we? We could look throughout the pages of, of Scripture to see that it's true. We can look throughout the pages of history to see that it's true. We can look throughout our own histories. We know people in our families, perhaps, of whom this has been true. And we even know in the history of the church, merely three, four weeks ago, one of the most prominent pastors, one of the largest churches in the United States, lost his ministry, lost his, presumably his family, and lost, lost the respect of the nation. And, and the name of Christ was, was, sou was horribly scarred as a, of, as a result of sexual immorality in his life. I'm telling you, we don't have to look far to know that this is true. Verse 15 turns a corner and speaks positive encouragement. He says, drink waters out of your own cistern and running waters out of your own well. Let your fountains be dispersed abroad and rivers of waters in the streets. Let them be thine only. And not a stranger's with thee. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. Let her, your wife, be as a loving hind or deer, as a pleasant doe. Let her breasts satisfy thee at all times. And be thou ravished always with her love. Why will you, my son, embrace or uh, be ravished with a strange woman? And embrace the bosom of a stranger. For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord. And he ponders all his goings. In our time together today, I want to speak to you with great 
um, clarity and just with forthright honesty about this issue of sexual purity that needs to be so much embraced in the lives of every man. Let's begin. I want you to write this down. There are three sort of approaches to this that I want to take. Begin by writing down with me. Let's, let's think about the battle, and it is a battle. Let's begin by thinking about the battle of a man's body. The battle of a man's body. Now, while you're writing that down, let me tell you that I, I'm going to skip the biology lesson for the day, okay? Uh, we are very intentionally all adults in this room. And we understand that men and women are different in ways that are much deeper than the obvious ways in which men and women are different. I don't need to have with you a biology lesson. But here's what we can draw from the scriptures. It is that the sheer volume of the scriptures that speak about men, and they are, they are overwhelmingly scriptures that are addressed to men, the sheer volume of them that speak to men about controlling our bodies in a way that honors the Lord as we control our sexual desires implies what we all know is true. And it is that generally speaking, men are created with a naturally higher sex drive than women. Now, for a couple of minutes, I'm going to speak in very broad generalities, okay? And you understand that there are many things that influence this. But generally speaking, all of us understand, if you've been married very long at all, you've figured this out, that generally speaking, men are created with a, a naturally higher sex drive than women. Ladies, I want to give you two words today that are going to help you understand your husband if you're married and understand men in general, okay? They're not hard words to understand. Uh, so here's the first one. Write, write this down or at least think about it. It's not going to be on the screen for you. But, but here's the first word to understand, okay? Always. Okay? Always. Here's what I want you to know, that generally speaking, men are always thinking about sex, or they are always ready to be thinking about sex. This is generally true. Now, I recognize, I understand there are a lot of things that influence this. Health influences this, stress influences this, life circumstances influence, age influences this. There are a lot of things that influence, I get that. But generally speaking, men's minds are made in such a way that, that they are always tilted in that direction. Again, if you've been married for very long at all, you understand this. Dr. James Dobson, who has had a wonderful ministry and career in our nation, speaking into the Christian community about family issues, marriage issues, health issues, sexuality issues over a number of decades... Dr. Dobson has spoken about this and written about this many times. And here's what he says, and I think it's worth noting, that men generally cycle through highs and lows of sexual desire about every 72 hours. That's, the, that's a general rule. And so um, what is that, like, like three days? And so generally speaking, that's the way that men are always thinking in that direction. This is the reason someone has said years ago the differences between men and women, that, that women are sort of like a crock pot, they got to heat up, and men are sort of like a microwave, just kind of like that, you know, it's because they're, they're, they're just already sort of pointed in that direction, all right? Thank you for giggling. That helped your pastor right there, all right? So ladies, just understand, just write the word down, think about it, always. It's kind of the way it is, okay? Always. The second thing that I want you to write down, the second word is eyes. Eyes. Here's what you must know. And you, you already know it before I say it. Men are visually stimulated. It's absolutely true. Generally speaking, men's eyes are a part of the process, if you will. This is the reason that the Bible speaks so forthrightly about this. I read to you Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. We put it on the, on the screen. Jesus said, you've heard that it's been said that you shall not commit adultery. I get that, but I got something more important for you, he says. Don't commit adultery with your eyes. Because he says it's very likely and possible and in fact common that men will sin with their eyes. So he says, I'm telling you that if you even look on a woman to lust, you have already committed adultery with her in your heart. In the oldest book of the Bible, the book of Job, not Genesis, Job. The oldest book in the Bible. Job says, I have made a covenant with what? My eyes. I've made a covenant with my eyes so that I might not look on another, on a woman, to lust 
after her. Understand this reality about, about men. Men are visually oriented, visually uh, stimulated. Now, by the way, doesn't this speak, just as sort of an aside, doesn't this speak to the absolute priority and value among sisters in Christ that we would ha- that sisters in Christ would have a very high uh, standard of biblical modesty. If, if our sisters in Christ understand the way their brothers in Christ are wired, doesn't it make sense that ladies would say, I will maintain a very high standard of modesty? And wouldn't it make sense then that if every father sending his daughter out on a date understands that the boy with whom she is going on a date, I don't care if he's 15, 13, 16, 20, 30, doesn't matter. He is going to be challenged in terms of his eyes. And so shouldn't a dad help his daughter to know how to dress when she goes out on a date? Be a great place for an amen. Absolutely it should. Which, by the way, maybe I'm two weeks late in saying this because it's prom season. Enough said. I'm saying to you that we should be aware that men are stimulated visually. Now, ladies... I want to tell you, I know that what I have just said to you, always eyes, is repulsive to some of you. I mean, in fact, some of you, because of those very realities, carry around this this frustrated indignation where you have a difficult time because of your own experience in the past, perhaps, maybe even because of ways you've been treated or abused and sadly and sinfully and wrongly, uh, maybe just because of this general reality. You carry around this general disgust for men and that you have a hard time seeing men as anything but animals or perverts. In fact, I mentioned the book, Every Man's Battle, and in that book, Arterburn says that after interviewing hundreds of women, he has discovered that among women there is a natural, he says, tug of war in the hearts of women between pity and disgust, between mercy and judgment. Where the women just say, you know what, I get it, but I don't get it, and I understand, but I don't understand, and what is your deal, and you're just a freak, man. Guys, or ladies, I want you to hear me say, the problem is the fallenness of man, not the creation of man. And if we understand the way that men are are wired, if we recognize the way that men are created, if we understand that sexual purity begins with the body of every man, then wives and women can help and men are responsible for making sure that we are surrendering our natural sexual desires to the authority of Jesus Christ to the power of scriptures and the authority and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Guys, we have to be honest about the bodies which we walk around in. It is a battleground. Secondly, I want you to think with me about the battle that we face in the sensual world that we live in. The battle that we face in this sensual world that we're living in. By the way, I I actually missed, I wanted to share with you an article to read, and I I skipped over it. Let me give give you the title of the article. About 20 years ago, I read this article in Christianity Today. I looked it up uh, just this past week to make sure you could still get it, and you can. It's in their archives. It's called The Anatomy of Lust. I would encourage all of you men to go read it, Christianity Today online. The Anatomy of Lust, the body that we're made to live in. Then secondly, we need to talk about the world that we live in. Because if there's a battle in my body, then certainly that battle uh, is, uh, is made the more difficult by the sensual world that we live in. I want you to look at Proverbs chapter number 5, which I asked you to turn to. And what you're going to discover as you read through chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7 is that, is that Solomon is speaking to his sons about the sensuality that is available to them in the world in which they're living. And he... he, and he, he He quantifies that sensuality in this picture of a strange woman. You'll see this in chapter 5 in verse number 3 to begin with. For the lips of a, here's the phrase, of a strange woman. Uh, You'll you'll see this again if you go down to chapter 5 and verse number 20. Will you, my son, why will you, my son, be ravished with a strange woman? Uh, Look over in chapter number 6 and verse number 23. Chapter 6 verse 23 says, For the commandment... 
is a lamp and the law is a light and the, the reproofs of instruction are the way of life to keep you. These things will keep you from the evil woman and from the flattery of the tongue of the strange woman. And then if you go to chapter number 7 and verse 4, you'll see it again. Say unto wisdom, you are my sister, and unto understanding, you are my kinswoman, because wisdom and understanding will keep you from the strange woman and from the stranger which flatters you with her words. This idea of the sensuality that's available in the culture is metaphorically used, and it's not always a metaphor, it certainly is true in reality, but it's metaphorically used in Proverbs in this idea of a woman who is called a strange woman. Now, the word strange literally means unlawful, or here's a way to say it, illicit, or it's this idea of what is forbidden. It is that that when embracing, when you embrace the strange or the illicit or the, uh, the forbidden uh, in terms of sexuality, it will always pierce and always bring a wound. And nobody in this room who's had your eyes open more than 30 minutes, nobody would disagree with me that we live in a sensually overloaded world. Everywhere you turn, the sensual involvements and invitings are everywhere. So, so what do we do? Because some men use that as a cop-out, don't we? I mean, some men have said, well, what am I supposed to do? You know, everywhere I look, everywhere I turn. I, nobody can help it. It's just the way it is. No. The command for purity is irregardless of the culture in which we live. It's irregardless of your marital status. It's irregardless of what's going on in health or in circumstance. God has called men to purity. Do we understand? So we're living, though, if we understand that we live in this overcharged, sexually overcharged world, what can we do? Well, let me give you three things, guys. Write them down real quickly. Here's the first thing. If you want to have the victory, if you want to win this battle to, for sexual purity, first of all, recognize the temptations. I don't think you have a problem doing that. I think you know them. Recognize the temptations. All of us understand. Everywhere we turn, every time you turn on the TV, there is sensuality presented to you. Every time. Every time you go to a movie... Even if you pick a movie where you have checked the reviews and you feel totally safe going to the movie, that you're not going to be immersed in a world of illicit immorality, as you sit through 15 minutes of previews, you're offered the next five movies of immorality that will be coming to a big screen soon. Every time you click on the Internet, you are invited into a secret world of illicit immorality. And sexuality. Every time you travel to another city where you are not likely to bump into someone you know or be accountable for your whereabouts or your online activities or your television watching. Every time you check into a hotel and you see the offerings that are offered to you in in-room movie options. Everywhere you turn, lust is there. And here's what we have to understand when we recognize these temptations. Lust is a liar every single time. Lust lies. Look at Proverbs chapter 5 and verse number 3. For the lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb. Her mouth is smoother than oil. The offering of lust, the offering of sensuality is inviting. It's beautiful. It's, it's sweet. It's promised to be satisfying. But she lies. Not only is lust a liar, but lust is always lurking. As I've mentioned, it's everywhere. When you read Proverbs chapter 7, he says in verse number 6, For from the window of my house, I looked through the window, and I watched this young, simple-minded, uh, unwise man walk down a street, and as he walked, someone dressed as a harlot began to reach out to him and say to him, My bed is bedecked. Come with me. My husband is gone. Sleep with me. And he's, he's walking through life, and sensuality and immorality and sexuality and impurity is just pulling him in. It lies, and it lurks around every single corner. And by the way, the New Testament says the same things. James chapter 1, verse 14, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust, and lust brings forth sin. We must understand that it is everywhere. Recognize the temptations. But don't only recognize the temptations. Hear God's warning. 
In fact, I would say to you that if you hear, that if you recognize the temptations and you don't hear God's warning, you're simply going to fall to the temptations. So you need to hear the warnings of God. Chapter 5, as I mentioned, verse number 3, here's the lie. The lips of a strange woman drop as a honeycomb. Her mouth is smoother than oil. But here's the truth. Here's the warning. Her end is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death, and her steps take hold of hell. It simply says that when we are drawn down this path of immorality or sexual impurity, it always leads to, to destruction and death. In fact, look at verse number 9 of chapter 5. He says, if you do this, don't go down that road because you'll give your honor to others. And your years, what, years of investment in family, years of investment of building respect, years of investment of building the trust of others can be gone instantly, cruelly stolen away because we yield. Let strangers, be, strangers will be filled with your wealth. Your labors will pass on to another. And verse 11 and 12 ought to rock you to your core. And you will mourn at the last day when you come to the end of your life. You will grieve saying, oh, how I hated instruction. And oh, how my heart despised my instructors and my teachers. You know what he's saying? If you go down this road, you will come to a day in your life when you will say, I wish I had listened. Man, I wish I had listened. I will be on the very verge of ruin, verse number 14 says, because I failed to listen. I'm telling you, gentlemen, that we need to hear God's warning about sexual impurity. Look at chapter number 7, verses 22 and 23. Speaking of this simple, unwise man giving in to temptation, he says that, verse 22, he is going after her like an ox goes to the slaughter. Has no idea. Caught up in that temptation, involved in that impurity. He's headed towards ultimate and absolute certain death. As a fool to the correction of the stocks, till a dart will strike through his liver like a bird hastening to the snare. And he doesn't even know that it is for his life. I'm telling you, sexual impurity ultimately will always bring death to things, to relationships, even to, to your own uh, blessing in life. And even your own life it can so recognize the temptations, men. It is a sensual world we live in. But recognize the temptations and hear the warnings of God. And then the third thing, don't just know that it's there and hear what God says, but have a strategy. I want to challenge every man in this room to have a strategy for winning the sexual battle. Don't just leave it a chance. And moms and dads, give your sons a strategy. Help your boys know how to navigate when they begin to move toward adolescence and young adulthood, help them have a strategy to win. What is a strategy? Let me, give you, let me give you some ideas for a strategy. Here's the first part. Have a Bible. That's number one. Have a Bible. <laughs> some of you are going, oh, good, I got that one. I got a Bible. No, no, no. I don't mean have a Bible in your car next to your bed. I mean have a Bible in your life. Because it doesn't do you any good to have a Bible in your car or a Bible next to your bed if the Bible's not ever in your life. This is what Proverbs chapter 5 says and chapter 6 says. Look at verse uh, 23 of chapter 6. What's going to keep me from the evil woman? What's going to keep me from the strange woman? It is the commandment and the law. It's the wisdom and the understanding of the word of God. It is the word of God which causes me to live in victory. It gives me the strength and the wisdom. There is instruction, there is correction, there is reproof, there is teaching. These things are in the word of God. And very often, guys, we fall into sexual impurity because we don't have the word of God in our lives. There's no input of the word in our lives. So you need the scriptures in your life. Make sure that there is a daily intake of scripture. And it will be for you a light and it will be for you a lamp. Secondly, not only do you need a Bible in your life, but you need boundaries in your life. You need to put some fences up in your life. What are your fences? If I were to ask you, if we were having coffee, and I just said, hey man, tell me, what are the fences you've put up in your life to keep you right in this area of sexual purity? What are they? Could you tell me? What are they with regard to your internet use? What are they in regard to who holds you accountable? Who's aware of where you're spending your time on the internet? Who's responsible for holding you accountable in your relationships? What are the boundaries you've put up in your relationships with coworkers who are females, with, with friends that you might say, well, she's my friend. What are the boundaries you've put up in your life? Put boundaries up so that you won't fall into the ditch of sexual impurity. And some of you might say, well, you're Telling me to be a prude, like to, you know, put up all these, like I'm an adolescent, a 10-year-old. i got to put fences in my life. Let me tell you something. There are a lot of men 
who's, who have lost everything in their lives because they thought they were too big and too strong to have fences in their lives. Put some boundaries up. If you need help understanding what those boundaries should be, we can give you some examples. The third thing I would say to you is that you need brothers. You need brothers. You may say, you know, I, I don't know who to talk to about this. But I'm going to tell you, you need somebody in your life you can talk to about, about this. So there needs to be a, another man, preferably a, a few other men in your life who are speaking to you, who are asking you the tough questions, and you're asking them the tough questions, and you're holding each other accountable. And it's not just a perfunctory sort of thing where you're going through a rote sort of you know, process or a system of accountability. Accountability is only as good as you are honest, okay? But it needs to be relationships where they know you, and they know when you're lying. And guys, the reason many of us don't have that and many men in the church don't have those relationships is because we keep others this far away from us at a distance so they'll never really know us. They'll never truly know the truth about who we are and we can always impress them and they'll always look at us and think we've got it together. And the minute I take my arm down and I say, hey, brother, would you come? And hey, brother, would you come? And let me get honest and tell you where I'm struggling, what my needs are, and how I need you to pray for me, and how I can pray for you. Then suddenly this bond, this, this fraternity develops where we're going to help each other stay out of the ditch of sexual immorality. You need a Bible. You need some boundaries. And you need some brothers. You show me men that have Bibles, boundaries, and brothers, and I'll show you men who very, very likely will stay out of sexual impurity. Okay? You've got to have a strategy. By the way, teach your boys to have a Bible, boundaries, and brothers. The last thing I need to talk to you about, and wow, I'm out of time. But let me just, this is so important, obviously, the text speaks to it. Let me, let me finish by talking to you about the blessing of purity and intimacy in marriage. The blessing of purity and intimacy in marriage, verses number 15, down through the end of the passage that we read, use a very common scriptural metaphor, very common imagery in the Bible to illustrate this marriage intimate relationship as a cistern or a well of water. In fact, in the most um, sexually charged book of the Bible, the book of Song of Solomon, uh, which is a very beautiful but very intimate picture of the relationship between Solomon and his, and his wife. And there are certainly metaphors there, and many people have, to, I honestly think, to, to, lighten the, to, the, to lighten the subject and to make it more easy to read the Song of Solomon and say, well, this is all about Jesus and his church and the fellowship. And I don't disagree with that, but I'm telling you, the song, book of Song of Solomon is very much a love story about a husband and his wife. And in that book of Song of Solomon, it uses this metaphor of a well, a cistern, a place to draw from where there can be fulfillment and refreshment and satisfaction. And that's what a marriage ought to be in every way, in every way. And certainly sexually, it should be the case. Drink waters, verse 15, out of your own cistern. Find satisfaction. Satisfy your thirst in that cistern, those waters that God has given to you in a spouse. Verses 16 and 17 and 18 talk about a family. Let your fountains be blessed and those waters running out. It's the idea of children born of that pure and holy relationship. I want to say to you, there is a divinely ordained relationship where God has not only allowed for sexual union, he has created sexual union and celebrates sexual union in the relationship between a husband and and his wife. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13 that the marriage bed is pure, it's holy, it is undefiled. And that that relationship should be mutually serving and mutually satisfying to both spouses. In fact, two words I would just give you in closing is if you look at verse number 15, he says, drink waters out of your own cistern and running waters out of your own well, you say, Pastor, I understand the battle is in my body. I recognize that I live in a sexually over, uh, uh, over focused world. So, so what's the context? Where, where does sexual expression, uh, where is it celebrated? Where is it holy? Where is it right? And, and here's the answer it is in marriage to your spouse, who the Bible says in verse 15 is your sister. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we don't have time to turn, you can read it later. But 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says this to wives and husbands understand your body is not yours, it belongs to your spouse. That's what the Bible says. 
Your body belongs to your husband, wives, uh, wives, your husband's, your body belongs to your husbands, the husband's, your body belongs to your wives. Okay? And in fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that in order to avoid sexual impurity, that a husband and a wife should have a mutually uh, blessing, mutually beneficial, mutually satisfying relationship that is not forbidden, except in the case of, of seasons of prayer and fasting. Now go read 1 Corinthians 7. It basically says take care of each other, love each other, and serve one another in terms of this sexual relationship. It's absolutely pure, and it ought to be mutually so. The second word I would give you is not just person. That's the first word. Your spouse is the person. In fact, let me just say this. The, your sp- there are 7 billion people on the planet, okay? 7 billion. Your spouse is the one person on the planet where God has given you the place, the union, the love to satisfy sexual desires. No other place or person on the planet. It is your spouse. Now the second thing, and the final word I want to give you is this word of permanence. So there's a person, and then that person is a permanent person. Look at verse number 19. Let your wife, the wife of your youth, this wife that you're married to, let her be to you like like an enchanting deer, a pleasant doe. Let her breasts satisfy thee at all times and be ravished always with her love. How long should I be satisfied with my wife? Forever. It's permanent. It's always. It's forever. Always be satisfied with her love at all times. Not part of your time you're satisfied with her. Guys, let me challenge you. Not part of your time you're satisfied with her. And part of your time you're satisfied with somebody you'll never meet on the internet screen. Not part of your time you're satisfied with her. And part of your time you'll be satisfied with a, with a woman that you work with. No. At all times, you find sexual purity and beauty in the relationship with your wife. So it is a battle for purity. It begins in our own bodies. It is accentuated by the world in which we live. But there is hope. And if we will have a Bible and some boundaries and some brothers, then we can live with victory in this area. If you understand, say amen.